You guys are about to discover how to harness your extended stay rental potential. And I'm so excited to break this to you that you have a lot of potential no matter where you are because you guys are all in good sized cities. So first I want you to know is that 36% of the people who are traveling in the continental U.S. are staying between one to six months. That's how, how long their typical stay is. The other part are these shorter term stays like a week, a couple of days, a weekend, but 36% is staying for a month and longer. Did you guys know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. So that right there, that phenomenon is your opportunity. And just like you guys didn't know, most people don't know. That's why you guys have a leg up right now. Well, guess who knows about this? These guys do. Yeah, these extended stay hotels, they, they set up a kitchenettes in them so that they can mm -hmm. capture that market. In fact, the development of hotels, like one in every four is going to be a extended stay hotel because the market is so big as they're building them out. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to express with you guys why that's so important for you. Shannon, was that you chiming in? It was. Um, I was a little slow on the unmuting my thing earlier to chime in, but... Um, I actually used to work for Candlewood as the director of sales. So there definitely is a demand for this market. And um, these brands, what they do is they'll have a tiered rating system. So the longer a guest is staying for, it's reflected in their room rate. And that's, that's right. um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, they're definitely in a niche market and it's profitable. And there are a lot of people that are traveling for construction or traveling nurses and we used to go after those groups and try to fill our hotel with them. Okay, so we're done here, Shannon. <laughs> 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 All right, let me, that's, uh, that's it, guys. He said it. I don't have any more to say. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, and, and Shannon, you were, you were wondering if it would work in your, in your location. Now, what do you think? If you went after these people, it would work in your location, yes? Right, yeah, it would. Okay. Is there any question about it in your mind that if you're right there, you know it's a growing market? Um, what, 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 what would you worry about? I don't, I'm not sure what the, okay. well, let's yeah. Let's keep going. Not, let's keep going and, and we'll see if there's we There's a hesitation. I can't put my finger quite on what it is, okay. but yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here because you can um, fact check me, okay? <laughs> okay, so these companies know about it and they are not nonprofits. They're in the business to make money and they keep creating different versions of extended stay hotels to go after luxury versus affordable markets. So there's a whole span of them. So during this time, we're going to try to keep this just to a few minutes, just to an hour, that um, you're going to understand a principle that drives cash flow. And once you understand that principle, then you can focus on it. And, and if you focus on it, then you can make it grow. You can make your cash flow opportunities grow. And we want you to have a slice of that 570 billion hospitality industry that would um, maybe make your life a little better, right? If you have a little slice of that. And a way you can retire in two years, we're going to outline a business plan for that. And you're going to like this webinar. It's going to be for you if, you if you want reoccurring passive income, that you're in the right spot for that. If you're willing to copy successful people and also successful businesses, especially if they're right in your town doing what we want to do. If you're willing to copy them and let them be your, your indicator of success, then you're going to have a good time. And if you're a landlord and you have a vacancy coming up, I want to give you a, an opportunity to consider a different way of operating your rental property or holding that asset. You can operate it as a traditional landlord or a extended stay landlord. So we want to talk about that. You're not going to like this if, if you're already rich and comfortable and don't really want to put any effort. You're not going to like this webinar at all. And um, if you don't enjoy serving people, because I'm, I'm going to be talking about the hospitality industry, and that means you like people and you like doing things for people. And if you don't like that, then this, this probably is not your business model. And if you're looking to get rich quick, this definitely isn't the right webinar because this, there's a, uh, work to be done and um, it's not quick. <laughs> and, but you can't, you can't get rich, whatever uh, version of that is, but it is not quick. There is work to be. So who am I? I'm Al Williamson. I'm usually up on stages. Like I was in Clifton, right? I was just there. <laughs> and I'm usually leading discussions about short-term rentals all over the country. I came up with a category called landlord science. And it's about how rental owners and, 
asset managers can find other ways to increase their income and how you use technology to lower your expenses. So that's what my whole science is. And since I'm retired, I can, I can make up my own career path. That's what I'm doing. So I sit on boards and, and I'm all over the country. I travel like once a month. I'm trying to slow it down. So um, I'm really Miss Francis Coney's classroom dad. I make copies for my, my daughter's teacher. So I'm uh, Mrs. Francis Coney, classroom dad. I need to be in town to do that and uh, on crosswalk duties. So I have 28 extended stay rentals and I've trained over 800 people on how to get involved with short-term rentals, this extended stay version of Airbnb. So we're only going to be talking about days, 30 days and longer. Okay. This conversation is not about the vacation market. All right. And here's a, a summary, kind of a, what the status of Airbnb is in the whole industry. You can see the Marriott, the JW Marriott has about 1.3 million rooms under management per night. I picked it off of their uh, third quarterly report all together, mm-hmm. rooms under management. And they're in 101 countries. And Airbnb has been around, what, 12 years. The Marriott's been around over 65 years. Airbnb has claimed in August last year, they hit one, 4 million rooms under management per night. And they're in uh, 276 countries. So you can see this is causing a lot of friction. This is the stage that we're on. This is why you see so many ordinances and people up in arms about that. Can you guys understand what I'm saying here? Mm-hmm. These guys have blown past the traditional brick and mortar hotels. And the thing I want you to walk away with this is that Airbnb has a lot of marketing reach and it's all accessible to you. So now you can compete against the Hiltons and the Marriott's. That's what's really cool about this. But here, I, wanna, I always point out that it, when you try to make more money as an employee, you, you go and get certificates and degrees, and then you get promoted, and then you get a bump in monthly income. But for an entrepreneur, you still have to make an investment. You know, if you want quick bumps in your profit, you do like Airbnb did. They went and got a bunch of coaches and mentors. That's how a bunch of two design students right out of college grew this market like that. They went and got coaches. Now, the problem is is that with short-term rentals, it's really easy to make a big gross income. You can actually work yourself to death (laughs) doing these short stays all all during the month. But it's hard to make a big, large net income, okay? So what do you guys want? You guys like a big gross income or would you want a big net income? Which one do you want more? Can you guys unmute yourself? Net, yeah. Oh, yeah, large net, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, net net is the only thing that improves your life, right? So, Mm -hmm. but the, uh, the way you operate to get a big gross income, that means you just take anything all the time, but to get a large net income, you operate completely differently, okay? And that's what we're gonna be talking about. If you guys don't mind, I wanna coach you through how an investor maximizes their net income. And it's a little bit of a more grown-up conversation besides talking about revenue. (laughs) You like, people love to talk about how much revenue they have, and that doesn't mean anything. Would you guys agree? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this, that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you guys uh, two, two secrets or two principles that's going to help you maximize your net income on these extended stay rentals. All right. Well, I kind of gave it away there. <laughs> these, this extended stay is more profitable. I think, Shannon, you probably heard it say a lot of times that extended stay hotels is common amongst them saying it's more profitable to um, house someone for 30 days, one person for 30 days, than it is to house 30 people for one night. When it comes right. to, yeah, yeah. So, so on a net income basis, the longer the stay, the less turnover, the less staffing you need, the higher your, your, your profitability on a net basis. So that's what we're gonna get into. It's a different way of operating and um, let's get right into it. Secret number one is it's a marketing business. And that's probably self-evident <laughs> that you got to keep people in there so that you make the money that you're expecting to make and without doing so much work. So most people I talk to, are, they're kind of hesitant about short-term rentals because they're worried about vacancies, about doing all that work, furnishing the place and having long vacancies and no one to fill it. But sound like you guys, you guys uh, concerned about vacancies? What if you can't fill yeah, it? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Well, let's do something about that right now, okay? That's exactly what a, an investor should be thinking about, <laughs> is how we can keep that thing full, okay? So let me tell you about Adam. He was a son of a preacher in Tulsa, and he was always doing well. He was always the goody-goody kid. 
he was the first one out of that small community to go to college and he got a master's in engineering finance. And then he turned that into a house flipping business. So he was doing really, really well until 2008. You guys remember what happened in 2008? Uh, the recession. The recession, yeah. A lot of people didn't make it. And he was one of them. He got completely wiped out, ended up sleeping in his car. And he felt isolated because he didn't want all the people that saw him at the top to know that he got wiped out so hard. So he was isolated, and that led to the depression. But he got some coaching out of that and got back on his feet. And then he started flipping houses again, but he had to, you know, it was harder to get money for him because he was bankrupt. And um, he was doing a good job flipping houses, but he felt like he was uh, busy, but not profitable. He was making all the lenders money, but there wasn't much for him left over for him. So when he reached out to me, he says, Al, everything I touch turns to crap. And I, I have this idea about making my flips, turning them into short-term rentals before we sell them. So that way they can uh, pay for their covering, the holding costs, and we can still do showings. So I thought that was a great idea. And when he told me his backstory about him being homeless and having a master's degree, I thought about myself. <laughs> I'm like, that could happen to that could happen to me too. So so what I did, I was pretty motivated. I really, really wanted to help him. I spent like a week just thinking and, and kind of teasing out what I was doing with my rentals and how I was intuitively able to fill them. And I came up with a process called the Blitz and Pivot. That's, uh, I just wrote about that in a Bigger Pockets article. You guys want to hear about it? No, oh, definitely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So when it comes to the different categories of short-term rentals, most people know about vacation rentals, right? And they, they go right to Airbnb and they know about weekend stays and, and those types of things. And they go right to Airbnb. When, so when I'm in a live audience, I, I do this joke. It's like your, your mama joke. You guys remember your, your mama's so fat or your mama's so pretty or yeah, you know, how pretty is she? So let's do that, okay? Airbnb is so good. You guys will say, how good is it? Okay. How, how good is it? How good is it? How good is it? How good? All right, we got it. It is so good that you can actually use it as your backup strategy. Oh, nice. Because okay. we talked about that marketing power. They're like four times the size of the Marriott, right? They got right. A, a long marketing reach. And it's so good that you can venture off and do other things and, and let Airbnb be your backup, okay? And let's talk about those other things you would do. You would do military housing. That's a type of furnished rental, yes. <coughs> mm -hmm. And corporate housing, that's really important. They're looking for more affordable options. Now, also furnished housing is a graduate student. They need their own type of housing. And undergraduate students, they need a separate type of, like you guys would, you would definitely furnish a place differently for undergraduates than you should, you should graduate. <laughs> so it's right. types. And then you got insurance. So insurance has a thing called loss of use when a place gets flooded and then your insurance policy has to pay for your housing somewhere for you to stay. And if you have kids, they're going to try to keep you in the same school district. They can't displace you completely. So that's why insurance companies end up paying up to four times the monthly, the going monthly rent to keep for uh, furnished rentals. That's pretty good, right? Four times right. per month. And also insurance adjusters, they need a place to stay when there's a disaster. So they're, they mobilize out and they have to do all those um, adjusting and all that paperwork. So they work for mobile offices and things like that. And then we've got medical. There's even flavors inside of medical housing. Most people know about traveling healthcare professionals like nurses, right? Have you guys heard of traveling nurses? Right, right. It's pretty common in California, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there's also traveling uh, families that support their loved ones. Like I have in, in my houses right now, I have two families that have their children on prolonged treatments. And one has a baby, one has a younger child. And that whole family has to be out there with me for three months. Okay. And then there's also medical students that travel, especially between July and December every year for a month at a time as they're doing their rotations through hospitals. So there's three types of medical housing that you can actually specialize in. There's temp housing. This is like a catch-all, but it's really lucrative for me because people in uh, Daly City and San Francisco are selling baby boomers. They're selling their homes for a couple million. <laughs> and, then they're, oh, yeah. and then they're retiring and they're paying cash for homes up in the foothills. And while those places are being built, 
they, they need a place to stay. So mm. they end up staying in my places in Sacramento, California, because I have a place for them, a three bed, two bath with a place for their dog, a little fenced in backyard. So they can't get that in the hotel. So that's why the more baby boomers that come online, the better my temp housing does. Mm. So if you decided to s- just to focus on temp housing and, and work with the realtors in your area, you don't need Airbnb, right? Right. <laughs> You don't need it. And then there's international ha- housing. There's lots of people coming over. I was just in Madison, Wisconsin. A lot of folks were coming over from London and um, through the Bay Area and all over. A lot of people come from China coming over and India. A lot of high tech workers are coming through. So they need temp housing. This is not their home. They don't want to buy furniture. They need furniture rentals. What do you guys think of all this? I'm kind of laying it all out for you. There's a lot of opportunities. What do you think? You've got me re-strategizing on a property <laughs> that we own in Warner Robins, which is a military town. Yeah. There's Houston Medical Center there. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I'm used to working with the insurance folks yep. whenever somebody would have a fire or flood or whatever. Yep. Those people are so des they're desperate. I mean, that's a that's a not a great word to use, but um They're highly motivated. Yes, they are highly motivated. So I'm mid rehab on what was about to be our fifth long term rental. Okay. But now I'm thinking, hey. Hey, I got you. I got yeah, your time. You got me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's a really good thing. I always do it in my Saturday workshops talking about how so they call Goldilocks. Because <laughs> if you're if you stay too long, you, you go to Craigslist and there's lots of options for year long stays mm-hmm. and that market is kind of saturated and has a whole market rate. You can't really go too far of that market rate if you stay in longer than a year. And if you're staying less than a year, then you can either stay at the Ritz Carlton or Motel 6. There's a whole span, but you don't want to stay either one of those too long because it's not comfortable. Either it's too expensive or too nasty. So in between where Goldilocks would be, right? This would just right. These, these days of three to three to seven months, that's the mm. sweet spot. And that's where there's no competition. And that's where the highest rates with the least amount of work is. Okay. That's why I don't do, oh, I do have um, some long-term rentals, but these furnished extended stay rentals is typically three to five times more profitable than a long-term rental on a net income basis. Okay. Mm. Anyway, which one, if the economy turns down, if we have a, another recession, which of these categories is going to suffer first out of these eight categories? Which ones do you think? Mm, corporate housing? You think that's going to uh, suffer before vacation rentals? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Vacation rentals, right? Yeah, vacation rentals, people's discretionary funds. Mm. And which category is the m- most people focused on? Vacations, like yeah, what vacation. I said. I was yes. talking about mm-hmm. buying a yes. condo. TV at the beginning of the call. <laughs> yes, that's what I was, I was setting you up for that. Mm. <laughs> okay. So these other ones, like military, if the economy goes down, what's going to happen to military housing? The demand for military housing, if the economy gets worse, what's going to happen to military housing? Mm. Well, the, the answer is nothing. Will be there. Yeah. yeah. It's mm. recession proof. Same with medical. I broke out those three medical things for you. Mm. The insurance companies can cover it. And what about insurance housing? If the economy goes completely into the toilet, what do you think is going to happen to insurance housing? Nothing. They've still right. got it. Well, they still have go. to pay for their insurance. Yeah. That's, that's right. And international has different influences, not tied to the U.S. economy. Mm-hmm. Right. And how about this? If everyone is suffering and loses their homes and they have an option of being homeless or going to a hotel or a temp housing, a temporary furnished rental, which one do you think they're going to pick first? Temporary housing. That's right. So it's, it's recession proof too. So now we got a lot of categories. Oftentimes people even go back to school during a recession. <laughs> right. So we got, we got some good categories if that if you focused on, I'm going to try to connect the dots for you. If you focus on a recession proof extended stay rental and let other people deal with their vacation rentals and you focus on these areas where you can make three to five times more net income, you're sitting pretty. Is a different life altogether. If you just dominated and became well known for international housing, like mm-hmm. for example, I, I ha- house people from, from China. I got a person off of Airbnb. They reached out to me first time in the US. I, I went out and met them at the airport. They saw my picture before they came and I, and I showed up at the airport. I was the face of America. I was the face of America. I helped them out. 
they were they were scared. You know, they're nervous. This mm-hmm. is the first time. Different, and then, so I brought them to it's called uh, my cross. I did a crosswalk technique, one of my marketing techniques. I brought them to directly to my furnished rental, and they already had some trust with me because we had chat before they even left China. Mm-hmm. And I get constant referrals now. We skip Airbnb. I've already been approved by the Chinese government and these uh, cancer researchers just come one after the other. They, they stay in the same place and um, it's great. I charge them even more than I would uh, regular people and they have no problem with it. So if you focus on one of these categories instead of vacation rentals, or, or I say in addition to vacation rentals, then you can have as less work involved because they're extended stays. There's nothing to do for months and months at a time. And you're making the same or even higher net income than people who are doing five, six, seven turns a month. Is that good news? <laughs> yeah. That goes back yeah. to the, that goes back to it's more profitable to house mm-hmm. a person, one person for 30 days than 30 people for one night. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all about net income. You operate differently than you do if you're trying to maximize your gross income. So we got some recession proof. I, I think I beat that to death, but um <laughs> so how, how would you feel if you had a checklist on how to market into each one of these categories? Would you feel like you could run a successful business? If you oh, yeah, definitely. All the best practices feel- for each category. I'm going to tell you about that a little later. Because I've marketed each one of these categories, and I'm still learning. Like Shannon, you know there's training for uh, salespeople for um, Candlewoods. They go mm-hmm. to these conferences. I go and to the sales is what they call it. <laughs> yeah. I go to those same conferences and I sit up in the front row mm-hmm. just so that I'm always on the cutting edge of all, everything that they're doing so that I can beat them. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, that's all I'm focused on is being the best uh, in the state marketer. So anyway, I got some resources based on uh, my studies and um, I'm always learning as well. Okay, so like in Daly City, there's probably um, short-term rental ordinances, right? Yeah, there are. Yeah. So those are for, and they define it as 30 days and less, typically. Mm-hmm. So I want you to put a different hat on. I want you to put a hat on that you're a month-to-month landlord and mm-hmm. you're following the landlord-tenant laws, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, regulators, they know that month-to-month landlording is the backbone for affordable housing because not everyone can, especially as they're struggling, not everyone can assign a one-year lease, especially people who are, have economic problems. So they did not, they never meant to touch anything related to month to month landlording. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you operate as a month to month landlord, a regular old crusty, regular traditional month to month landlord, and you use these internet techniques and these advanced marketing strategies to fill your month to month rentals, Mm -hmm. then you don't have to worry about those ordinances at all. Oh, interesting. Your insurance company knows exactly what to do. There's mm-hmm. no extra taxes or anything. You're just following the landlord-tenant laws. How you market it is your business, okay? I wanted to free you from all that. And that's that's such question. a good point because um, I listened to the Bigger Pockets podcast the other day with Avery Carl, and she was talking about, well, her thing is vacation rentals on Airbnb, but she's you know z- zeroing in on only like true vacation markets because there's no telling what the laws will stipulate, you know, with some of these like metro markets and, and things like that. Right, right. So this is like a, it's like a loophole. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unexploited opportunity for sure. But you can do this. You could be a month-to-month landlord with a lot of integrity. Mm-hmm. You're not working in the shadows and you're not worried about the changing, um, you know, what that regulator ate that day how they're going to change their (laughs) mind because they're not going to touch affordable housing. They're just not going to month them up. Landlord is, is here to stay. Okay. That's my opinion. I'm right. (laughs) That's just my (laughs) opinion. Okay. So I share with them all those strategies and I I said, let's start working on building relationships in those recession proof away from the vacation rentals. And that's worth your time because if you just dominate one category, you can become financially free pretty quickly because you become the, the circus Olay in your area for mm-hmm. that niche and you can completely replace your, your salary really quickly. 
So he started paying for his, his holding costs for his flips and making an extra $700 a month on top of that. And then he did that for a few months and he said, I'm quitting flipping. I'm just, <laughs> it's so much easier to have this passive reoccurring income. In Tulsa, he was able to get five of them. That's all he needed was five rentals on doing these extended stays. And he was able to pay for his housing costs, his utilities and his car payment. So whether he got up or not, he has some security in his life now. And I asked him, I said, Adam, can I use your story? And he said, yes, Al, but if you do tell people I'm not l- sleeping in my car anymore, that I have, <laughs> I have money to, to travel and that it works, make sure you tell people it works. And, and he's always very grateful for all the analytics that I, that I put together because I'm an engineer. I have to know revenue is great, but net income is what changes your life. So, mm-hmm. So that's secret. That's a really big thing is blitz and pivot. It's just one of my 14 strategies about marketing and pivot. Part of it is if say you're doing military housing and that market happens to slow down, then you just simply, you have a furnished rental, you just pivot into insurance or you pivot into international. You don't sit there and wait for Airbnb to give you a a booking. You should always be actively cultivating these relationships in these other categories. That's how you build a big safety net and a very robust business for yourself. So if there's one car at that at the nearby extended stay hotel, then they should come to you. Okay. In fact, I always tell people if there's an extended stay hotel in your town, then that means this business model is going to work for you. Mm-hmm. Okay. And especially if there's the same brand multiple times, there might be three extended stay Americas and two residents in, you know, and then some lower end brands like Staywood and things like that. That's just telling you that you have a very strong market. You definitely can offer people a lot more cheaper. That's why people will always come to you. And especially when you niche down into these categories, you guys are getting it now. I can hear it in, in the silence that, <laughs> that you can see that you can quickly do something with the same taxes that you pay, but yet make the income so much greater and do it less work. And just a few of these things spews out so much money that it could cover your basic housing costs. You know? So how would it feel like if you had your, all your housing in Daly City, that cost of your mortgage or whatever, covered with passive income? Oh, that'd be great. That'd be perfect, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're not a millionaire, but you have a lot more peace in your life, especially right. if it's coming from a recession-proof category. So whether you lost your job or not, right? Mm-hmm. I love, I call it toggling when people get enough passive income to cover their housing expenses. That's all I want to give people too, because that makes such a big difference, real life difference than them swinging for the fences and taking a lot of risks, doing a whole bunch of things. That makes an immediate impact on their family. And that's what I want my legacy to be, is how many people I can help toggle and give them that peace of mind. Did I talk that to death? I talked that forever, (laughs) didn't I? Man, (laughs) there's secret too. But it's so important, just that one strategy. I mean, we Mm -hmm. didn't get into, we talked a little bit of crosswalk and some other things, but um, the marketing piece is so important. Most people, like right now, just what you guys know, you got eight gears. Most people are just in one gear with Airbnb, Mm -hmm. just that one gear. Now you guys got eight gears. So you know how to move around. Just that strategy alone should help you feel better about keeping your place filled. Well, how do you guys feel? You feel a little bit better, less worried about vacancies now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm actually looking really forward to this part right here, rental arbitrage. I think this is what I'm trying to get into here in New York City. So with those skills of being able to market and keep something filled, it takes the risk out of rental arbitrage. Right. Which, which a rental arbitrage, that means arbitrage means to buy and sell an, an asset or something that makes money at the same time and, and, and do so without risk. Mm-hmm. A lot of people leave off that last part, but it means to buy and sell simultaneously without risk. So mm-hmm. when you buy a house or buy a rental, you're controlling it with a mortgage, right? Mm-hmm. But do you own it or does the bank own it? The bank owns it. Okay. Now you can control a property with a, with a mortgage and you can control the same privileges with a lease agreement too you can control something. Uh You can control it with a joint venture, right? So there's lots of ways to control a rental and get the cash flow from it. And there's all kinds of synthetic ownerships like putting options and right of first refusals and things like that. So you can get all the benefits without owning. And, you know, Nelson Rockefeller says, the secret to success is to own nothing and control everything. And also, I want to just bring to your attention, there's a reason that banks don't want real estate, don't want the physical real estate. They want financing on real estate because that is where the cash flow comes from. Right? It's not the bricks and sticks. It's the difference between the income and expenses 
that improves your life. I let that marinate a little bit. Wealth building is the real estate that that's building your equity, maybe, but the cash flow. Well, let me back up a little bit. If you guys work a nine to five jobs, do you guys work nine to five? I do. Yes. Okay. That is, you're being arbitraged. They're mm-hmm. paying you one thing and they're billing you out a lot more mm-hmm. higher. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you replace your income with some rental arbitrage, if you place your job with rental arbitrage, then it's the same thing. You're, they're both are arbitrages. Instead of you being arbitraged, you're arbitraging a different asset. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's what I want, Shannon. I want, I want to open you up to the fact that there's other ways to control rental if you're interested in cash flow. If you're interested in capturing the equity, you definitely want to purchase it when it makes sense. You, you always want to purchase something that makes strong financial cash flow sense. But in this seller's market, it's hard to do. Mm-hmm. You can sit on the sidelines because nothing pencils out or you can open yourself up to being a, a rental owner and someone who arbitrages, someone who rents someone else's rental from them. So that took me a whole year to, to allow myself as a rental owner, someone who's a proud landlord since 96 and writes a blog called Leading Landlord and landlording, ownership, buying assets all up in my DNA to realize that my family was suffering because I wouldn't allow myself to arbitrage. I had to keep going to my engineering job because I wouldn't allow myself to arbitrage. So I want to speak to you guys through that here. What is it? It's when you get someone else's dwelling, someone else's boat, someone else's apartment, someone else's single family home or in-law quarter. And then you talk to them about running your corporate rental company. Remember, we're not doing vacation rentals. Mm-hmm. Running your corporate rental company from their place. And you work out all the subleasing clauses. You get that all worked out up front with integrity. Okay. And then you put your furnishings in it that you go buy. And then now you got a furnished rental. And then you go market it online and offline, okay? You got to do both. You can't just <laughs> sit behind your computer, okay? And, and you start taking vacancies because more and more people, Airbnb is so easy, more and more people are jumping on and doing the same old thing. So you guys have a little more strategy already and you understand you have to go offline as well. Okay, so if the, the cost of the rental and all the utilities and expenses per month cost you $1,000. Your goal is to bring in a gross income of $2,000. So that $2,000 comes in, $1,000 goes out, and $1,000 goes into your pocket. Mm. That's arbitrage. That's rental arbitrage business summed up. All right. So here's another picture of it. Let that blue bar be what a market rent of a single family home. uh, I mean, let's say a one bit, one bath. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the top of that red bar right here being what Candlewood Suites charges per month. Blue bar is what the monthly rental market of a one bed, one bath, and this being Candlewood Suites. Okay. You follow me, Shannon? Yeah, I'm here with you. There's this big old spread between it. It might even be $3,000 difference between the two. Could be two, 3,000. Daily daily City is going to be 2,500 or something difference between these two. Mm -hmm. No matter how much this rental, it could be in New York, it's going to be higher, but the, the cost of hotels is even higher. Okay. So there's a spread. And what we're talking about is accessing the spread right here. We're not Mm -hmm. talking about the expense. So we're moving into banker's terms. We don't care how much it costs. We care how much the margin is. So in Daly City, it's still the the cost of residence in is so much greater than the cost of housing that you can, you have a margin. Mm -hmm. And even in Georgia, where you are, Shannon, the cost of uh, extended stay America or hotels that use the government or the general service administration's numbers that you were talking about, Shannon, mm-hmm. the GSA. GSA rates are so much per, per month, even with the, the different adjustments for three and six months, even with those 75 and 55% adjustments. They're so much greater than what the housing rents are that you have a, a margin there that's all available for your cash flow. This is how you cover your monthly housing bill by tapping into that. Let's give an example. This is Rochelle. She's in Reno, Nevada. And she was a house flipper too. And she was kind of a wild and free. She didn't have any kids, but she had a best friend and she had goddaughters and her best friend was dying of breast cancer Mm. and asked Rochelle to, you know, make sure her kids were going to live with her mom, the lady who was dying. And Mm -hmm. she knew her mom was bad with money. And she asked Rochelle just to make sure her, her girls had a few extras, you know, dance lessons, gymnastic lessons, just, you know, so they're not strapped, so they have a good life. 
you can imagine if you're dying, you just want your children to have a good life. Rochelle couldn't say no. So she said, yeah, but she knew she had to get her, her own financial matters in order. <laughs> that's what kids do to you, right? Mm-hmm. Kids make you straighten up your financial act for sure. So she reached out <clears> to me and she says, Al, I know you focus on business travelers and I want to get into this rental arbitrage thing, but I have these kids now and I have a friend who's dying and I can't even think sometimes. I can't be duped by your course. I want to invest in your course, but I can't be duped. I need it to work. I can't be these like these other things where I start and I stop and I don't finish it. And I promised her I was going to walk her through and we're going to dock it. In fact, I told her, I'm going to walk you through and we're going to video everything just to prove it because I am absolutely not going to let you fail. So what we did is I gave her a six-step plan. And one of them was like, what we're talking about now is the or- first step was kind of get yourself oriented to the mobile workforce. I think Shannon, you talked about that earlier, got lots of people who live one place but work separate place for extended periods of time. That's the, the mobile workforce. Now that we have laptops and smartphones, that is just growing and growing. That's just taking off. Location independent, which are working status, and the gig economy is, keeps growing as well. So I, I, the first step is getting oriented to that and stop thinking about vacation rentals. There's a lot of money to be made in vacation rentals, <laughs> but why am I trying to pull you guys and direct your eyes away from that is because there's some recession-proof options for you. I want you to build your business on in the recession-proof area. I feel, I, I don't know, it's on my heart. It's like I'm morally obligated to get people to be recession-proof before they need to be. I just want you guys not to chase in the vacation rentals. Anyway, I'm beating that to death. So we got this place. She followed some checklists I had for her about how do you find a place, you know, the right size, the right location, what that means. You want to be in a um, location. She picked the option of being in the location that had an annual festival because when Hot August Nights, which is a car show, happens in August, the hotel rates a triple. So I want her to be in that because she'd be able to participate in that. So she found a place and she found the owner and he was, he said, when he looked at her place after he agreed, it's like the place never looked better. She was taking such good care of it because she needed to take good care of it for her, her business, right? So mm-hmm. she's, she's actually a super tenant. When a rental arbitrage person is, should have more swag about them, I always coach my students because you're more on the landlord side than a regular tenant. You can't allow a leak under the sink, but a regular tenant could. So all those, your place has to be in tip-tap condition all the time. And that's what you position yourself to the landlord so they understand that. And that's how you get them to say, yeah. And then I gave her, I told her, stay with my checklist. Don't over-furnish the place. Watch your startup costs. Quick story, CNBC reached out to me and they were talking to me about being a host on their short-term rental reality show that they wanted to do. It's just kind of like a HGTV thing. And I was interviewing for that. And, and um, they said, Al, can you design? I say, yeah, I, I can design. I, I know how to make storage spaces and stuff, but I always encourage people to watch their startup costs because you honestly don't make any money until you paid off your startup costs. So I always warn people not to spend $20,000 on startup. You know, don't, you can't spend more than six to seven times your net income. I brought up that word net income. No one wants to talk about that. And they asked me again, they said, Al, do you know how to pick nice sheets and, and all the, you know, make the place look really luxurious and, and I'm like, yeah, I do, but you know, I, I don't want people spending more than six and seven times their net income because I see it all the time. I travel around, people spend a lot of money and it t- may take them two, three years to pay it back and they quit before that. So I don't like, to, I, I always warn people, and that's, that was the end of the interview. That was the end of it, no callback. They were mostly interested in uh, selling commercials versus being a, a grown up about your business. You know, I'm at a different, Airbnb, sometimes twice a month, different different cities. And I talk to the hosts. They have no clue what their net income is. And they have nice places, but they have no clue when they break even. And it's really tragic because not only they're burnt out, but because uh, these, these short-term roles are fun. The first 50 times you turn them over, you meet people all over. But that 51st time, you start to say, oh, man, this is a lot of work. <laughs> the thrill is gone. <laughs> You know, you want to start doing extended stay rentals and you want to pay attention to your... Often people come to me after they they have a really nice place and I'm like, man, I wish I would have got a hold of you before you furnished the place. It's hard for me to bail you out. I mean, I can help you, but I I really can help people by helping them not over furnish. Anyway, that's it. I helped Rochelle, gave her a checklist of what to get and why to get it, you know, 
So it's really important to know why to get rolling drawers, drawers that have rollers in them versus friction sliders. Uh, if you get it for free, that's great. Just, <clears throat> she's buying used consignment stuff. Nice stuff, mm -hmm. paying attention. She took a, a, a bed from her own guest room and brought it over, trying to keep her startup costs down. So we were successful at that. So she used her insider knowledge. This is an out-of-state landlord, okay, who owns the place. And she used her insider knowledge to get the place that was affected by hot dog and nights. And that's how she started making $900 a month uh, on the property she doesn't own. This is net income. It's not bad, right? Not bad at all, no. Well, here's the, here are the tiny numbers. We were negotiating back and forth. I was helping her by email. That's one of the things I offer, email support, helping her negotiate this contract with him. We knew his um, per diem, right, Shannon? You can look up with the... General Service Administration's per diem. So we knew that yes. he was making over $100 a night in housing. And so, and like Rochelle, you don't offer him $1,800. It's got to be over to let him save $900 a month. So that's why we got this up. Like, you know, we said, you're going to have to move out during hot August nights. And he's like, if I move out, I'm going to have to pay more somewhere else. So why don't I pay you more each month? So that's the summary of how we got up to $2,100 per night. But he's, you know, he's pocketing. So if he has $100 to spend on housing per night, that means $3,000. That means he's pocketing $900 of tax-free money per month. So he's a very happy guy. And he's going to be in town for 10 months on a construction project. So she's not taking advantage of him, right? Mm -hmm. Not at all. The, the owner, she pays $850 for that cottage. And the landlord's happy. The place looks better than he ever had before. Then she pays electric, gas, Wi-Fi and renters insurance and landscaping, $350. So that's how we get to that monthly net income. And mm -hmm. that's the grown-up conversation to have. But I think we got to go further. We got to say, who's making more money, the, the, the rental owner or Rochelle? Rochelle. Yeah, Shannon, you see that? Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. what if the rental owner was doing extended stay rentals? It would look like this. I'm saying out of that $850, that's his gross. He has to pay taxes and insurance out of that, and most likely a mortgage. So he's probably only netting about $400 a month if I'm generous. He also has to pay for the maintenance of the place, okay? Because things break down, we landlords know that. They, mm -hmm. they wipe out our profits. So I said, what if he was only making $400 of net income, but he could also make that extra $900 that Rochelle's making of net. So he would turn his place into a $1,300 per month place that's three times on a net income basis, three times what he's making as a, a, a traditional landlord. So if you own a portfolio of rentals, you should definitely have one of them, at least one of them. It's almost, I get myself in trouble, but let me say this. <laughs> it's almost negligent at this point. It's been like 13 years of short-term rental is well-established. If you don't have one of them in your rental portfolio, then you're not a really, oh, I'm not going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> because if you had an asset, if you had an asset manager, the market is outperforming this asset manager for so long, you would fire them, wouldn't you? Oh, definitely. Okay, so that's what's going on. I'm firing myself as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, you have to have at least one. Is ne is ne you're, you're leaving a lot of money on the table mm -hmm. if you don't have one. Okay, so her startup costs. Let's, let's have a, a more of a grown up conversation. We got to talk startup costs. Mm -hmm. People don't like to talk about that. They like to talk about monthly income, but they don't talk startup costs. 4100 that's first month's rent, security deposit, furnishings, all right? Mm -hmm. And then $900 a month, we, we establish that number. So you do the, do the math, and it, she breaks even to four and a half months, and that's what she was thrilled about. She was thrilled that she had money for gymnastics now. She got that 900 can pay for the ballet, the gymnastics, and still have some left over. And then she, she went out and got, got a few more of these places. And she's using rental arbitrage for a few other things. But we were in the same place in, at a note conference. And people were saying, Al, you got you to gotta put it on video with you and her together. So that's what we did. And when we were sitting down. I said, Rochelle, I can use your story, right? And she said, no, Al, you cannot use my story because you did, you did a piss poor job of explaining that um, <laughs> I didn't need my own money to do this. See, her, her rate of return is 120%, that's, but annualized is around 150%. So that mm -hmm. means she could have, and I was telling her this, I said, you can borrow money at 10, 20% and make this work. You don't need your own money because if she borrowed money at 20%, she borrowed money at 12%, okay? Mm -hmm. 
and she's making 120%, that means she can afford to pay them. <laughs> she can afford to pay the interest. <laughs> and it's not, it's not the rental. It's, people get wrapped up in the interest rate versus how much interest they actually pay out of pocket. Those are two different things. If you can pay someone back in four and a half months, mm -hmm. then you're not paying all that interest. So once she understood that, she was like, okay, Al, you got to explain to people better. And we went back and forth around and around. I said, okay, we're going to use this uh, agricultural analogy. We're going to say, uh, for now on, if I share her story, I'm responsible for teaching people how to borrow a little bit of someone else's harvest and so that they can plant those seeds. And I'll teach them how to nurture it so that they can grow their own harvest and they can pay those seeds back to that original person with interest, with more seeds. Now, there's no excuse. Anybody with a little help, and that's what I, I promised her I would help people, I don't care if you're a waiter, you can do rental arbitrage. You can borrow a little bit of money from someone else. It's only $4,000, right? Mm -hmm. That's a credit card swipe. <laughs> so there's no reason, Shannon. You don't need your own money, Shannon. You are always in position to do rental arbitrage and to take advantage of, of that margin between the rental rates and the hotel rates. You just weren't aware of it at the time. Yeah, I had it. definitely had it. I heard rental arbitrage, but I just didn't really, you know, I just assumed, honestly, that the landlord would be against it. But the way you presented it, I understand totally what you were saying that, hey, it's a benefit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have all kinds of scripts and things about that, but it's how you talk to people. If you start off saying, I'm going to Airbnb your place, or you start off by, I would like to run my corporate housing company out of your place two different responses. Right. Yes. So here's that business plan I was telling you about. This is what Easy Corporate Housing, the company that I run, I decided I was, when I got my head out of the sand and I decided that I could be a landlord and someone who arbitrages, just like the President Trump can own things and arbitrage the U.S. post office and turn it into the Washington Trump Hotel. That's all an arbitrage. Even hotels, as Shannon, you know, they go stick their brand on someone else's building and they arbitrage it, right? They start running it. Everyone arbitrages except for landlords. We have to own everything and we suffer with that business model because we need to do both. Just like you need a carpentry toolkit and an electrical toolkit to flip a house, you need to be able to do rental arbitrage and own properties uh, that make sense so that you can quickly get yourself out of nine to five work. But anyway, easy corporate housing. What we did, my business partner, he's a 33-year-old real estate lawyer, and I'm a 54-year-old whatever I am, <laughs> former engineer, former civil engineer. And we both put $5,000 into an, a bank account, $10,000. And we, mm -hmm. we did our first rental arbitrage that made $500 a month net income. All this is net income, okay? And this mm -hmm. access down here is just months. So I did the math. I was like, if we don't spend the money, we just let it build up, we can reinvest it. And then we have two rental arbitrages. And if we don't spend the money, we can quickly fund a third one. And if we don't spend any of that money, it'll build up and we'll be able to fund a second one. It's almost like these arbitrages are having children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're, they're funding each other. You follow me, Shannon? Yep. Yeah, okay, definitely. So I, so I said doing the math. I said doing the math. It looks like a month 23, we could start taking out $10,000 a month of net income if this works. That's what the engineer says. So all we do, we start with $10,000 and we could end up taking $10,000 a month. I said, Ember, can you, does your housing costs less than 5,000? He said, yeah. I said, mine's definitely less than 5,000. Personally, I own rentals and I rent my own home <laughs> because it's not, a, it's not an asset. And my rent is less than $2,000. So one of my apartment units, furnished rentals, rents for $2,200 and I have 23 of them. I have 28 of them. So one first rental can cover my rent where we live. So I could quickly leave my engineering job. Anyway, so this is the business model. And we started doing it um, and we were going too fast. Now, I want you guys to know, this is just the gas pedal. Mm -hmm. You have to have a break as well. That means you need to have savings. You don't have to go this fast, okay? It'd be irresponsible of me to, to leave you with this impression. But please, you got to have some training to do this. You got to have some marketing skills so that you don't run vacancies and you have to understand that you need reserves to go along with this, okay? Mm -hmm. So don't go try it on your own, <laughs> please. Uh, please, I've seen, I seen people get over, they were reinvesting their money so fast that they would deplete their bank account each time they did something and they couldn't stand any vacancies that come up. You know, then it starts the wrong type of snowball, okay? Mm -hmm. You gotta have savings. All right. So you guys promised me, get some training, look into it a little bit. There's some more sophistication to it. Okay. So inside of number two, arbitrage for cash flow, absolutely. 
anybody can afford to do this because I'm going to show them how to borrow someone else's self-directed IRA. Okay, that's a huge resource. People love that, love giving loans, and there's plenty of money out there. There's no money in it. Banks are paying, what, less than 1% still? If you offer someone 10% to use their money, you're up and going. In fact, you shouldn't be using your money. Just like if Shannon, if I get a chance to work with you, we'll be helping you shift from being an investor to a banker. Because how much money do the banks use of their own? Uh, None. They use everybody else's money. Exactly. Exactly. So that's a different thing you want to add to your investment mindset. You want to be an arbitrager or a banker and an investor at the right time. When it's at the top of the market, like we are now, where the numbers simply just do not make sense to purchase anything, you should be arbitraging all day long so that you can make cash flow so that you can spend it when it becomes a buyer's market. Or what we use at Easy Corporate Housing, we take our cash flow now, we don't live off of it, we use it to buy other assets. And maybe I'll show you later on, but we're actually using our rental arbitrages to uh, build a extended stay hotel here in Sacramento. Hmm. Oh, wow. It's a very powerful tool. You just got to know how to wield it, but anyone can do it. And both of you two, if you're listening to me, and if you have a couple of extended stay hotels in your area, then you are two years from retirement. I'll let that settle in. I could prove it to you too, but all right. So here it is, the spread. This is a summary. No matter what the rental rate is, if it's your own rental, what you rent it out at as a traditional landlord, you can make a lot of money on top of that because there's a difference between the rental market and the hospitality industry. The rental industry and the hospitality industry, there's a spread there and you can access that spread. It's all for those who have the eyes to see it. You guys got any questions? I've been talking, mate, talking, talking, talking. I went long today. Hey, will you circle, Al, you mentioned um, self-directed IRAs. What was your, what were you, um, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So there's two things. One, people who have self-directed IRAs, especially small dollar IRAs, are just can't find any small loans to fund. It's very, very difficult for someone who has a $5,000 in their retirement self-directed IRA. They just can't do anything. They have to wrap a note or something more complex. So there's a, there's a huge community. Financial Friends Network is a great way of getting in touch with those folks who have lots of IRAs. Then the other thing is, since there's no mortgage involved mm-hmm. with these arbitrages, that means they fit inside of your self-directed IRA. Your self-directed IRA can own a, an arbitrage because it's a contract and your rental arbitrage can fund your retirement so you don't have to contribute to it anymore. Okay. So let me, can I, I'm sorry. Let me, let me I'm like mind blown over here. So the property that I was telling you about earlier that we are mid rehab on in Warner Robins, it's actually owned by my self-directed IRA, mm-hmm. but I could go lease someone else's property from my IRA and then use that to your, do extended yeah. stay short-term rentals? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, your IRA can rent the place and you get a partner um, to actually do the work. Yeah. You have to do arm's length, right? Right, yeah. And yeah. I, can, I can work with that partner to help them market it and then you guys split the profits. Huh. I, mean, I mean, your IRA, your IRA and that partner split the profits and then you're essentially <laughs> won't outlive your money because you'll be funding it. In fact, you can put a few of them inside of it and you'll be just fine. Those and are, so you have world. the other person running it and then the profit that it makes goes back into it. That's smart. So that's what I do. I help, I help people. Jeez. So again, I, I focus on um, becoming the best at marketing and doing these things so that I can help your partners fund your IRA so that you guys can retire rich. You know, that's essentially it. Because you know, if you're still thinking going to Yahoo to advertise, things change over time, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's Google now. If you're trying to post on MySpace, no <laughs> you gotta you gotta stay up with the trend. And so that's what I do is I do that and I train people. Because if you can consistently create net income, then there's no risk in this arbitrage anymore. Mm-hmm. If you know how to keep people there and you're not needing your own money, if you understand that, then you guys are financially free right now. You guys can quit, right? I quit and, and take a different route right now. So that's what I did when I woke up. I said why am I driving two hours to these bridges and eating all this junk food and feeling fat and feeling like I'm going to have a heart attack and then drive two hours home and my children don't even know who I am and they're struggling in algebra. <laughs> and I'm fa- and, you know, as a failure as a dad, why am I doing that? I can just do some arbitrages and pay for all that and, get, and replace all that. So it was very quick. I didn't need to do that. Hey, can I tell you guys about my coaching and training program? 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. definitely. So it's called extended stay for landlords. It used to be called Airbnb for landlords, but Airbnb got on me about their copyright. Uh-huh. I'm yeah. like, that's okay. You guys are my backup plan anyway. Yeah, no, yeah. this is it because I am like hitting my forehead saying should have had a V8. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? Like, yeah. why didn't I think of this? I, I mean, I used to be. Yeah, you were there. This, I was, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you know, you know, I'm telling the truth about this. And no, and, I know. And, yeah, and it's lots there. of people. Here's what's good, Shannon. Lots of folks are not looking at this because Airbnb gets paid off the gross marketing managers get paid off the gross. I think I'm the only one talking about net income and talking about extended mm-hmm. stays. Extended stay industry is well established, but they're not trying to talk to landlords. I mean, home two suites is nothing but a furnished apartment building mm-hmm. for, for youngsters. Mm-hmm. And they know the worst nightmare is that landlords wake up and realize they can offer a lot more and that hotels can never compete against a, a furnished rental. Yeah. And then you don't have, you don't have somebody above you, beneath you. And I'm, each side of you. <laughs> yeah, you can never compete against that. Mm-mm. Yeah. Well, here, here it is. So the six steps, like I gave Rochelle, I'm always pointing out because <laughs> I wanted to, it took me a while to realize that people wanted a step-by-step plan. And to do that, I should organize myself in the steps. That was like, a, I woke up, just couldn't believe that simple statement. How about I organize my course, in the steps? <laughs> so step one, I have tasks for each step. So mm-hmm. all you do is do the task and you're going to get the result. That's what I was talking about. If you can just, copy, just follow the checklist. <laughs> That's all you have to do. So mm-hmm. mobile workforce is all about step one. We kind of talked about that earlier. And people who are using these vacation rentals and these furnished rentals, they're either tourists or travelers. And which one causes all the problems? <laughs> the tourists. Tourists. So we don't, <laughs> we strategically avoid them. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we, we're reducing risk all along. We're managing our risk. So these travelers who on extended stay, they have, they want certain amenities. Like you can stay at a place for a week without a washer and dryer, but if you're going to stay a month, you know, that, that joker better have a washer and dryer somewhere on the premises, those types of things. They have internal needs, loneliness and things that you need to be able to address and empathize with. And they have a separate set of goals that if you write your sales copy after those things, you can keep your places filled. So understanding that's really important. And step two is discovering your market's potential. Shannon, that's kind of going and understanding the GSA rates and things like that. And also understanding you know, what game is residence in doing? You know, 33% of those people at that residence in are staying for a month or longer. What mm-hmm. game is Extended Stay America playing? You know, they want one third of the people at res- Extended Stay America are either at, you know, 55% or 75% GSA. So understanding those things, because the buy a mattress costs you the same. You could put it in one market or you could put it in a different market and make a lot more money. So it's really important to understand which zip code you should be putting your stuff in. So we do all that. And basically I study these hotels and like I said, I go to the same training. So I understand and I read their quarterly reports. Mm-hmm. So I, I know what they think their trend is. And I take them a couple of years to roll things out and I can do it overnight. And so can you guys. And then how to furnish, when we talked about this, you got to pay attention to how you furnish the place. I have it all in checklists. So if you want to order everything off of Amazon, just click, click, click. But I also tell you why you want things. Like if you want traveling nurses, why you should have blackout curtains. You know, I tell you why do things. And also I do checklists so that you guys can hand it off to someone else. Interesting. That's the thing. Checklists. I want you guys to hand it off to someone else. Okay. So furnishing the place, save you from wrecking yourself. How to market for extended stays. That's really important. That's a checklist too. This is really critical. And I do a checklist again because there's a lot of routine things you need to do. And I want you to hand it to your VA and say, if you have questions, go ask Al. Don't bother me with it. So we had eight categories of extended stays and I have best practices for everything on that. One important thing about this check about what we build out, and I'll show you later, is if these stays longer than a month, you know, you got a long time to find a replacement tenant. Mm-hmm. If you have a vacancy, you failed. You know, because you got plenty of time. If you're sitting on your butt, you'll have a vacancy. If you're a day 25 before you have 25 days left, you should be starting different marketing activities. Day 10, you should be doing different marketing activities. You should never have a vacancy. Okay. That's how I feel about it. And that's why we create a system on how to do that. So that anyway, that's my opinion, but it's right. 
if you have a vacancy, <laughs> you failed because you, you failed you failed to get your systems together. Okay, so transitioning, this is really important because you may start off doing great with uh, short-term rentals, but you're you're busy, you're busy, you're busy. You have a you're a CEO, but you're still a job. You know, you're busy right. with it. The goal is is to move it to passive. This will show you see my system. Right here is the countdown. And, you know, day 14, my VA starts up a different marketing activity. We may be playing with our rates. We may be changing our headlines or different things that we need to do so that there's never a vacancy. I get this table sent to me by email once a day. If we have a red mark on it, it means we've, we have a vacancy. And if it looks like this, that means there's nothing to do that day at all. I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm Mrs. Francis Coney's office you know, classroom dad. And I'm a, I'm a crosswalk guard. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> I, all right. So uh, rental arbitrage, everything you need to know about it, all the scripts and how to talk to landlords, how to negotiate. And remember, we, we talked about how important it is to have the right angle, how to write the right emails and things. We just use what works. And I was talking to some my clients about that the other day. They were trying to offer six months rent and everything up front. I'm like, man, just go back to my scripts. Just use that email because it works. Don't offer a, that sounds so scammy when you start a long email offering all kinds of crazy perks. Mm -hmm. You know, might as well be from Nigeria. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had one yeah. girl reach out to me once with like a year up front worth of, and I thought, what's the, you know, yeah, same thing. It sounds yeah. so scammy. Just stay with my scripts. Just copy what works. And you don't have to reinvent this thing. Worksheets on how to find the right place, just like Rochelle did. You got to get the right location. There's a lot to that. Checklist again. Why checklist, guys? You guys should get this now. Why am I doing things with checklists? So you have so you a can, system. So you can hand it to someone else and let them run the system. Yeah, pass it, right. Yeah. And you can quickly modify it, but it should always be in a checklist because that works. <laughs> All right, so six steps there. The value of this is well over 1597 But I want to, I don't want to just sell a course. I want people to get results. You know, my legacy has got to be people have enough passive income to replace their housing costs, to cover their housing costs. So that's why I have a, I do group coaching. I show you what I'm doing, oftentimes Facebook Live, and then on Facebook, our private Facebook group, you can interact with people from all over the country who are doing the same things, these extended stays. So we have our own community. I just started writing for Bigger Pockets again. I stopped for a long time for a number of reasons, but I'm starting again. I still am not putting all of our secrets out there. I'm like, huh? I'm the general. I'm not going to tell you where my subs are. I don't share secrets. I share them inside my private Facebook group. Yeah. People's livelihoods are online. I'm not sharing everything. So unlimited email support directly to me. I don't sub it out. And these numbers are they're my time and then they're, these are values. You know, it's a $2,900 value because I respond to you as long as I have breath. There is no expiration date on that. And then um, Ninja Training, with this is the third bonus. It's, um, it's a 60-minute one-on-one conversation where we create a personalized action plan for you. And what it is, if you need help raising funds, we do that. If you need help city ordinances, we do that. Or, or rent control, we do that. Oftentimes, I put the our pitch decks for people so they can, and we record them. So all they do is share the video and they raise money. So that's how it goes. Because I don't want you using your own money if you're doing rental arbitrage, just like a bank doesn't. How to grow your business like this, the systems I use, and we go over how to deal with expanding your business, city ordinances with integrity, how to deal with rent control with integrity, all kinds of stuff. What do we need to do during that time? This is the catch-all, okay? So that's a $3,000 value because on numerous times, you know, this hour has resulted in $500 more net income per month. I'm listening to your questions and everything. You are ready with just this webinar this discussion here, know how to raise your income by more than $500 a month. Just what we covered here. So we go in more in depth in that. So all together, you add it all up, is the cost of a used car is <laughs> 9997 But this is a vehicle still. It is a vehicle a lot of people use for financial freedom. But of course, I'm not charging you guys that. You know, I have a less amount on my website. I want to talk to you about resources though. People ask me, oh, what the lease addendums, you know, how do I price a three bed, two bath house? I can't use GSA. All those resources are, for the past five years, included. Templates for you to use, okay? So it is a real world value of $9,997, but of course, I'm not charging you that. It's on my website, it's $1,297. And if you guys are here, I'm going to give you guys a special, so hang on, okay? 
But those people on the replay, I'm going to be talking to you right now. But if you're here with me live, just stay with me. I've got a bonus for you. So the gift is you go to extendedstaylandlord.com and it looks like this. And you click on the roll button. And you also gives you a chance to go through all this, the curriculum. And you can even preview a few modules to, to see if you like them. But you can see the detail that is there is really everything. Being a nerdy engineer, I like to put together a good system that I'm really, really proud of. And so you click on that button and you roll now. And there's a 30 days to look it over. And there's a no questions asked. So there's no risk. And we're always talking about risk. So that is it. Go to extendedstaylandlord.com. And I look forward to working with you.